Uh, talking genetics, uh, is there a standout genetics project that you're working on right now? Anything you're particularly proud of? Anything that's maybe close to being released that people should be excited about? I've, I've been doing a lot of work with uh, a Red Lebanese Puck line, and I'm, I'm, I'm really into it. It's, it's just stellar quality. But what, what's been interesting to me is the, the, the change in the relationship between cannabis science and cannabis. So, you know, the, the two factions, uh, we would say culturalists and scientists have bu kind of butted heads. But what you're seeing now is more of a collaborative situation. Mm -hmm. And you're starting to see science being able to bring their technology into the world to help improve the crop and ho hopefully improve the experience of the consumer. And so I'm just fascinated with this, the new world of triploids and not so much for the sterility component because I don't really worry about the intersex issues. We don't have pollen contamination. What's a triploid? And triploid is, is where you're taking um, cannabis and you're mutating a plant and that mutation doubles the amount of chromosomal material. And when we take that mutant and we then lay it back into its original source, it overrides some of the genes and it allows us to have like unbelievably um, powerful effects on metabolite production. Right. So you're starting to see maybe 30, 35%, we would say like louder cannabis and the, uh, a, a bigger cross section of cannabinoids and more developed and also vigor. And that's coming out of this triploid. That's coming out of these triploid populations. Right. Yeah, and it's just the beginning of it. And so you, it started a couple of years back it, it's in almost all ag products, but with cannabis, it was uh, rare. We used to have polyploidism back like in the 80s, late 80s, 90s, where farmers would mutate cannabis, take that plant, go into cannabis, pull out varieties that had these accentuated traits, but they didn't have the ability to really look at it on a chromosome level to really determine is it a true triploid. So you had breeding, but sometimes I think it was more intuitive instinctual, where now you can say, hey, this is definitely that, and what they did is they developed triploids heavily in Oregon for uh, pollination issues. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted farmers to be able to grow crops that weren't able to be pollinated so that you didn't have to worry about losing your crop value to your neighbor having males that were unrobed pollinating okay. your field. So most people look at triploid as this sterility issue and they look at it as they're locking up the gene pool so nobody can use it. But it's, it's really the ability to take a plant and then enhance other qualities. And so I don't have to utilize the seed. What I can do is I can create a triploid product and then I can take a clone and hold it and it's gonna maintain its, its variation, but it would allow me then to have something that absolutely was unbelievably unique in its output. Mm -hmm. And I think we're just really beginning to touch it. And so there's, a multi there's multiple seed companies that are involved in it. But for me, what I want to be able to do is see some of the historic lines woven in with it so that what we can do is we can take the things that really built our desire and, and love in cannabis and see what happens when we turn the volume up. And as long as we uh -huh. maintain the source populations, we never lose the initial work. And so mm -hmm. the main point with anything in preservation first is the whole pure source populations, mm -hmm. but then you can do whatever you want with it outside of it to find out how do you get the product that the customer is most attracted to. So they intentionally introduce a mutagen. Yes. And then grow out the population and mm -hmm. then identify the unique Ident image, just the same way you would. Otherwise. Exactly, right. exactly. And so you have, you have it in, in many, many commercial crops utilize this technology. If it, if it occurs in a mammalian species, it typically results in death. So when we start to create uh, unstable uh, code in us, it doesn't work. But with plants, it works pretty well. And is this, and is this a newer thing? Because you know, I took a breeding class with DJ Short um, 15 years ago, and he had mentioned um, you know, the genetics he's always worked with. Um, he started out with this Thai and this mm -hmm. Afghani. He made what he called the cross. Mm -hmm. Out of that came his blueberry and flow. Okay, the flow being more of the Thai expression, the blueberry being more of that Afghani expression. Um, but over the years, he's just continued to work within that initial cross. Um, and he's began to see some mutations coming out. Mm -hmm. And when he did his research, 
he said he found that it came from the tie end of the genetics because it was his understanding that the Thai back in the 70s were using mutagens. I think he mentioned colchicine. Mm -hmm. Colchicine. Is that one? It's, um, a, it's, a, it's a chemical they use to in, induce this replication. So it takes you from a 2N into a 4N. So basically you're just doubling the code. And when we take the double code and lay it on top of a, a, a typical 2N plant, it overrides the 2N and it allows us now, and with cannabis though, it's interesting because where does it seem to show its effects in, in vigor and in potency and in aroma? And so the things that most farmers are concerned with and most customers are concerned with are where we see this, but you can't use the first generation that colchicine induced plant is, we would say it's toxic. But when we take that and then go into another plant, then we just have now regular plant material. And so it's a natural occurrence in many plants, it's just not controlled. Uh -huh. But with ag science, you can control it. And the point being is that we, to me, we all, you need to have this duality. You have to have preservation where you're trying to keep what gene pools you can somewhat preserved and pure the best degree possible. Once we take a gene pool from Cambodia though and we preserve it in California, it's no longer the same thing because you're not getting the microbiome and the environment from Cambodia to, to make this relationship. It's like the primary colors. Yes, okay. but we're holding it, we're, yeah. we're at least holding it, we're keeping it alive. Because the world is, is swirling so much that everything becomes homogenized. Mm -hmm. And the idea of keeping these original sources separate so that you can always go back into the pool. But as farmers, things that grow better, or things that have more resistance, things that give the customer greater satisfaction. That's what all farmers want to grow. And so I'm just fascinated with the, the science of it because I'm like, if I really like sour diesel, what happens when I turn the volume up 30 more percent? How would somebody know if what they're, you know, the seeds they're buying or the product they're buying was produced with something that was one of these? Uh, You'd have to have a scientist like, take a look at the, the chromosomes. You that's can't, the only you, way. yeah, you can't tell by just looking at it. You have to have, you have to have it uh, analyzed. But once we have it analyzed and we know, then we can say this product is that, and then, then you can utilize it. And the issue that most people have is that they see it as this plant can't be pollinated, they're forcing you to buy the seed, mm -hmm. they're trying to monopolize and control. But the reality with cannabis is that the cannabis, the, the, the gene world of cannabis is held in so many different hands. It's unlike any other crop. There's a lot of seeds out there. <laughs> Unlimited, and and I for me, plenty. for me being a, a, a someone who's you know into cannabis preservation, meaning I, I like to hold source material, and then share it. It allows us to be able to have these living gene banks, and then it allows us to separate the concept of preservation with production, because as a farmer, if someone said, "Hey, I have a plant that I developed, and it has a complete resistance to powdery mildew," you'd say that's a great plant. I have a plant that's unbelievably resistant to botrytis, so we have a bad season, no problems. We have a plant that we've developed that produces a metabolite compound that makes aphids not want to work with it. That would save you probably a billion dollars a year in California due to aphid damage in all the commercial greenhouses. Is this technically GMO? No, no it's not. GMO. Because we're not going into the gene. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and we're, 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 we're. DNA and, 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 and replacing it with, with, with other foreign DNA. foreign DNA. With foreign, GMO is foreign DNA. And so GMO is genetically modified organism. It means I take two dissimilar types of gene and, and put it together from different species even. Yeah. So if I mix an eel and a human, I have GMO. But if I just do scientific breeding, that's not GMO. It's just really what you're doing is you're working with gene frequency and you're using mutations to drive adaptation and value into the cultivar for production. And so for me, I'm not looking for necessarily more power, but I would love to take varieties that I really like and I'd love to see them opened Crank up. Crank it up and yeah. take it up to 11. So, yes, I'd like to see what 11 is. And so that's what I'm really fascinated with is working on some of these projects. And, and my, my relationship with the teams that do this is more of a, what a customer's like, what's needed as a farmer. So I'm not a scientist, but I get to work with scientific teams on that end of it. What is desirable and what is valuable to the farmer? And if we can get plants that grow better and we can have customers that are more satisfied, 
then that's a great thing for cannabis. Yeah. Uh, how much firsthand experience do you have consuming this, uh, this triploid stuff? I've only smoked it uh, once or twice so far, but yeah. I have a bunch of seeds that I'll put out this year in my own home patch yeah. so that I can sift through and then take a look because it's the hash cultivars that I'm really interested in is that when you're applying some of this uh, polyploidism to those plants, you get an exceptionally large trike head. Wow. And so you're starting to get some, you know, the, the idea of a bigger head means that you can put more into it. And also it allows you to tailor your extraction a little different. And, and I'm just really interested in all these things because you, you can't stop technology from moving forward. You can't live in the past. You, you, you can say that, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to use fossil fuel, but if you have a pair of rubber shoes on, you're using fossil fuel. So there's no way to get around it. It's just really about how do you work with it intelligently and how do you create a situation where you have gene banks that are pres preservation, gene banks that are production, and then why are we using it? What's the purpose? And for me, you know, I like open source cannabis. I like the idea that most of the things that we've used prior have no ability to be patented, no ability to be trademarked or controlled so that it allows anybody who has historical cannabis to be able to have like ownership of it. In a, in, a, in a healthy way. They don't, they don't technically own it, but nobody can come and take it from them. Yeah, yeah, but if, you, if you got some, uh, you know, uh, normal seeds, you got mm -hmm. the ability to produce a male and female, and you yes. got the ability to produce thousands more of those yes. seeds. And, and okay, I mean, I produced, I mean, I've literally produced 800 seeds off a plant this big. Oh yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can get up to 50,000 seeds in a 16 square foot space. So off every four by four grid, done correctly, you, if you were really running a, a, a scientific breeding operation, you're getting about 50,000 seeds off that grid. So seed production is unbelievably prolific. Yeah. And for most people, playing with the seed is what I like. That's why I, I share stock. It lets people play with stuff and find things that really suit their needs. And that's the, the home user. That's individuals that want to grow for their own selves. And, and I love that because I don't think that the, the dispensary world suits everyone. It, it primarily financially. I think that because you're having to charge for the product that creates a situation where many can't afford to consume what they want or at the level they need. So for me, I'm really an advocate for home growing my whole life because that's the only way you can really consume freely. With a little bit of effort, you can produce as much as you need. Out of a small know, place for, for yeah. the average individual. But when you're talking about farming, when you're talking about producing product that's for commercial purposes, you really have to be able to use the tools. And it's like saying that, you know, I, I don't like the idea of drip irrigation, but drip irrigation saves you a lot of water. So it is, is it bad that you're using it? Is, is watering by hand any different? And, and in some ways it is because you're forced to be present with each plant, but you're also far less efficient with your water usage. So like when you start to really argue about technology and then cultural practices, at the end of the day, when you're using a garden hose, well, people historically didn't have garden hoses, so they're using buckets. So I don't see you using a wooden bucket. There's give and take. And yeah, there is. There's like, a balance. Yeah, people like picking on silly things sometimes. 